In this video I'm going to decode the signal sent from this I remote to my Zumba bot. This signal follows the NEC protocol, which is one of the most common infrared protocols used for transmitting signals between devices like remote controls and TVs. And while my Zumba bot is meant to be fully autonomous, having a way to control it remotely is going to be useful during development. And regardless, I must be able to decode a start signal to adhere to the competition rules. The basic flow is that I press a button on the remote and it transmits an infrared signal. The eye receiver on the PCB picks up the signal and toggles a pin connected to one of the GPIOs on the microcontroller, which forms a digital signal that can be decoded in software. And since I haven't moved over to the robot yet, in the meantime I will do this on the development board and confirm that it works by tracing the name of the button I currently press. Taking a closer look at the signal itself, here I've connected the eye receiver to the development board and hooked up my oscilloscope to inspect the signal. By triggering on one of the flanks, I can get a still view of the signal when I press one of the buttons. As I mentioned earlier, the signal follows the NEC protocol, which is well documented, but basically it encodes a 32-bit message slash data frame using a series of pulses of different lengths. And if the button is kept pressed, a repeating code is sent at a given interval. So overall, a fairly simple signal. Now let's dive into decoding the signal by setting up the interrupt on the GPIO connected to the eye receiver and measuring the time between the edges using the timer peripheral of the microcontroller. Similar to some of my other videos, I'm going to first implement the functionality in this video in a standalone project inside the IDE. Just to make this video a bit more uh, isolated and standalone in case you haven't watched all of the other videos in this video series. And then when I have something that works, I'm going to move the code over to the rest of the project code. Okay, so first creating a new project inside Code Composer Studio. And this is just going to be an empty project targeting my particular uh, microcontroller. And then targeting the GCC toolchain, which is the same toolchain as I'm using in the main project. And I'm just going to call this IR remote. And it's going to be an empty project. And the first thing I need to do here uh, in, in the main file is going to be to do some general initialization of the microcontroller. So stopping the watchdog and also configuring the clock speed of the microcontroller. And then I also need to enable interrupts, since that's something I will be using in this uh, driver that I'm going to write. Uh, I also need to initialize or configure one of the IO pins, uh, the IO pin that's connected to the uh, IR receiver, which is the pin that I'm going to configure to trigger interrupts on the falling edge. And as you know, if you have watched my previous videos, uh, in the main project code, I have a bunch of uh, IO related functions to make the uh, IO configuring uh, more clean. Uh, but here I'm just going to do something uh, temporary. And the IO receiver uh, is connected to port uh, 2, uh, the first pin on port 2, so 2.0. And I'm configuring this as a GPIO input uh, pin and with no pull-up resistor since there is already a pull-up resistor integrated into the IO receiver, so I don't need to use the one inside the microcontroller. And then I can just call this inside here and call MCU init at top of the main function. And then I will just have an endless while loop here. Yeah, it doesn't really matter as long as I don't return from this function. Okay, so that's what I have to do uh, in regards to um, uh, the initialization of the microcontroller. And then I'm going to create two new files to hold the driver for the IO remote or the IO receiver. And that's just going to be an implementation file as well as a header file. So I'm going to call that iRemote.c. And iRemote.h and beginning with the header file I can start defining the functions we need to have here so first of all I'm going to have a function uh, for initializing this driver so I'm going to call that iRemote init and then I'm going to have a second function to get the uh, most recent command that we have received and I'm going to call that iRemote get command and that is also not going to take any arguments but it's actually going to return something it's going to return ircommand.e which is going to be an enum 
that I have to define here as well. And this enum is just going to hold uh, the values or the commands that this microcontroller can send. So it's just a way for me to name the individual uh, buttons on the uh, I remote. So that's going to be zero. So all of the buttons from zero to nine, followed by some of the special buttons. So star, hash, and then the last value is just going to be a value to represent an invalid key. I mean, if, if we haven't received any command and we call this function, it should return ircmd none. And later on, I'm going to assign each of these values in this enum to distinct integer values that represents the exact uh, command value that uh, I remote uh, sends. Uh, but I'm not going to do that right now. Okay, so that's it for the header file. Uh, then I can jump into the implementation file. And first of all, include the header file. And starting with the initialization function, I remote init. Uh, what I'm going to need to initialize in this driver is going to be uh, to make sure that an interrupt triggers on the IO pin as well as configure the timer peripheral that I'm going to use to track the time between the individual pulses. Okay, so I'm configuring interrupts to trigger on the falling edge of uh, this IO pin. So the same pin as I set up here, so pin 2.0. And I'm shortly going to explain why I'm just configuring it to trigger on the falling edge and not on the rising edge. And then I'm also going to have a function to initialize the timer peripheral. The timer peripheral is a peripheral you can set up to trigger an interrupt after a given amount of clock cycles. And in my case, I'm going to configure the timer to trigger an interrupt every millisecond, since that's the granularity I need for this driver, since uh, the pulses that I'm tracking, uh, all of them, like the time between all of them is going to be uh, one millisecond or more. And this means that I have to do some simple calculations here to convert from uh, millisecond to the number of clock cycles, taking into account how fast my microcontroller is running at, which is uh, 16 megahertz, as well as uh, any scaling that I add to the timer peripheral. And you can configure the timer peripheral to take the, its input clock cycle from different clock sources, but I'm going to have it take it from the subsystem main clock. So that's going to be running at 16 megahertz as well. And I'm going to set the prescaler to eight so that the timer peripheral uh, takes the 16 megahertz input and then divides it down, uh, down to uh, two megahertz. So it's going to trigger uh, its tick at the rate of two megahertz and not 16 megahertz. So first to define for the divider or the prescaler, and then I can calculate the ticks per millisecond uh, by dividing the uh, clock speed with the divider, so eight. And this division gives me the number of ticks per second. And to get the number of ticks per millisecond, I have to divide by thousand. And the reason I'm calling this I3 here, uh, well, it should be called ID3, uh, is because that's what they call it inside the uh, header file provided by Texas Instruments. So I can just write ID3 here. So that's right here, uh, and it's the biggest divider, uh, dividing by eight. And I want interrupt to trigger each millisecond. So that's what I'm going to write here. And to get the number of ticks per interrupt, I can just multiply ticks per MS with the number of milliseconds. So that's just going to be one. And I can also add a static assert here to make sure that this is not bigger than it's allowed to be, since to configure the number of ticks per interrupt, you write to a register that is only 16 bit wide. And this means that you can at most configure it to trigger at uh, around 65,000 uh, ticks at most, since that's uh, what the 16 bit register can hold. And this is also one of the limitations with the timer peripheral that you can't have it interrupt uh, 
less often than the maximum number of ticks that this register can take. So if you want something to happen less often than this register can handle, you need to use a separate variable that you increment each time the interrupt triggers. So for example, if I want to have something happen after 20 milliseconds, I can configure the interrupt to trigger each millisecond and then for each interrupt I increment the variable and then when once I reach uh, 20 in this case then I can do something. So the static search is just going to be a sanity check. So it should be less than or equal to. And then I can write to the registers related to the time peripheral to configure it as I want it to be configured. And as always, uh, these uh, peripheral uh, related registers are described in detail inside the datasheet. So writing this to this register is going to configure the timer to take this clock as the input source and the ID3 to set the divider to 8. And then I have to write to this register to configure when or after how many ticks the interrupt should trigger. So that's going to be the ticks that I calculated up here. And finally, I'm going to enable the interrupt. So with this configuration in place, the timer peripheral is going to trigger an interrupt every millisecond. But I also have to create two functions to start and stop the timer because after this uh, configuration here, the timer is not actually started. And to start the timer, I have to write to this register again. And first I'm going to get the current value of uh, this register, uh, but I'm going to clear the part of this register that are related to the MC bits, so the bits that controls uh, how the counter of the timer behaves. And the way I want it to behave is to count up to the value that I have stored inside uh, this CCR register. So I'm going to be writing MC uh, underscore one. And the MC bits are just two bits, so I'm going to create a separate mask or a variable to hold the mask so that I can easily clear these bits. find it up here. It's going to look like that. And I can clear those by taking the inverse of this mask. And I'm also going to write TA clear here. And this is going to make sure that when I call timer start, I'm also um, clearing the value of the current counter. So for example, if, I if the timer is started and then I stop the timer before it reaches the uh, count when the interrupt occurs, um, then this counter uh, register is going to contain a value larger than zero. And this just makes sure that I clear the value of that register. And similarly, I'm going to have a function to stop the timer. And here, instead of uh, writing MC1, I write MC0, since that's uh, the way you uh, stop the timer. And I can also add a comment above these two to make it more obvious. And next I'm going to add the interrupt function, uh, the function that's going to be called uh, when the timer interrupt uh, occurs. So this is just going to be a function that I add the uh, interrupt attribute to. And in this function, I'm going to have a variable I call timer ms that I increment each time this interrupt triggers so that I can keep track of how many milliseconds that has passed since the timer was started. And I'm also going to add a timeout here to make sure that the timer is stopped after a given amount of time in case there is no more commands uh, coming in from the I remote. So if I stop pressing the buttons on the I remote, I don't want this uh, timer to continuously be running because that's going to be wasting uh, current and it's just going to be unnecessary. So I'm going to have a sanity timeout here that's going to stop the timeout when the time MS value goes above this uh, timeout value. So as long as it's uh, below this timeout, I'm going to be incrementing the timer, but as soon as it goes above it, I'm going to stop the timer. Uh, I also need to reset some more stuff here, but I'm going to do that later. And I'm going to set this uh, timeout to 150 milliseconds because during normal transmission there's never going to be more than around 110 milliseconds between two uh, pulses. So setting it to 150 is more than plenty in this case. And let's just check to see if this compiles now. Does not. 
Yeah, since we're not using some of these variables yet. Yeah, and I also need to define this variable and I can make this um, 8-bit value since it's never going to go above 150. Uh, I also need to include assert as well as std int. Oh, this shouldn't be void here. This should be double underscore. Now it compiles. Now I have the initialization in place, uh, which means that I have set up the IO pin uh, connected to the IO receiver to trigger on each falling edge. And I've set up the timer peripheral to trigger an interrupt on each millisecond and also created a function to start the timer and a function to stop the timer. So the next thing I need to implement is going to be the function that's going to be called each time a falling edge happens, which is going to be the main function in this driver because that's the function that's going to be parsing the incoming signal. So I'm going to add a new interrupt function here for port 2. And first I'm going to check if the interrupt happened on the first pin of this port, since that's the pin that the I receiver is connected to. And once again, I have all of this handling in place in the main project code. So the way I write it here is just temporary and I will replace it with the proper code uh, in the project when I move this implementation to the main project. And I'm going to have this call another function called ISR pulse which is going to be the function that handles the decoding of the signal. And then I also have to clear the interrupt. And to understand what we need to do in this function, we have to understand the protocol that, that is used for this signal. And as I mentioned before, this protocol is called NEC. And let's just have a look at one of the images here. You can take this one, for example. The way each uh, key press is going to be represented uh, in this protocol is going to be that each transmission is going to start with the signal being held down for 9 milliseconds and then held, um, pulled up for 4.5 milliseconds. And these two represent the start of a transmission. And then uh, the following pulses is going to represent the address. Uh, so that's going to be an 8-bit value followed by the inverse of the address which can be used to do some error checking on the address value. So these two are going to take up 16 bits in total. And then uh, this is going to be followed by the command, which is the value that we're actually interested in this case, since I'm not going to care about the address, uh, since that's going to be the same uh, for this uh, IO remote. So I'm actually, in my implementation, I'm just going to discard uh, the address. And then this is followed by, similar to the address, it's followed by the inverse of the command, which can be used to do some error checking. Okay, so in total for each key press, we're going to receive 32 bits. And these individual bits are either going to be a 1 or a 0. And whether it's a 1 or a 0 is determined by the time between the edges or the pulses. And initially, the way I approached this implementation was to implement a state machine to keep track of where inside the transmission that I'm currently in, which meant that I had a state to track when I was at the beginning of a tr transmission and then some other states to keep track of where I was in the rest of the transmission. And I was setting up the interrupt to trigger on both the rising and the falling edge. And while this implementation worked, it forced me to write quite a lot of code, uh, which made uh, the implementation take up more flash space and also made the implementation a bit harder to follow. But then I realized there was a simpler way to implement the decoding of this signal because I don't really need to track the, both the rising and the falling edge or to keep track of exactly where in the transmission I am with a big state machine. Because what I can do instead is just to track the falling edges and the time between the falling edges. So in my implementation now, I'm just going to track the time between the falling edges and use that to decode the signal. And this makes the implementation much simpler. First, I'm going to create a struct to represent the total 32-bit message. So this struct is going to contain the command, the inverted command, the address, and the inverted address, exactly as I just showed you in that image. 
And I have to put these individual values in this order so that I can interpret this entire struct as a 32-bit integer that matches the byte ordering of uh, the processor on my microcontroller. And to represent this as a 32-bit integer, I'm going to be putting this inside a union. So with this union, I can either uh, interpret this IR message as a 32-bit integer or as uh, the, this decoded message with the individual 8-bit values. And when I receive a pulse, the first thing I'm going to do is to stop the timer. And then I'm going to have a variable that tracks the number of pulses that has occurred. So for when the interrupt occurs, I'm going to increment the variable that holds the pulse count and I'm going to add it up here. And looking at the signal again, I can see that it's going to take one, two and three pulses before I start receiving uh, the individual bits of the message. So I'm going to have an if statement here that's going to check if the pulse that I receive now is a pulse that represents a bit. So I'm going to have a separate function to check that called is bit pulse. To decode bit value. And I'm going to make that in line since I'm going to only call that function here. And making it in line will remove the extra function call overhead. I don't actually need to pass the pulse in this function since the, pul the pulse count is already av available uh, globally inside this uh, compilation unit. Uh, but I'm going to do that anyway just for uh, clarity. And as I said, the first bit value in, in this message is going to start on pulse 3. So it's going to be this so it's going to be this pulse right here. And then there is going to be a falling edge for each bit value. And since there are 32 uh, bit values, uh, the last uh, pulse is going to be 34. Because if we count from 3 to 34 including uh, 3 uh, we get 32 uh, pulses or 32 falling edges. And if it is a bit pulse, I can determine whether it's a zero or a one by looking at the time between the previous pulse and the current pulse or the time between the falling edges. So when it's a one, the time is going to be longer and when it's a zero, the time is going to be shorter. First of all, I'm going to make room for the next bit by shifting the raw value of the message. So by shifting the 32-bit uh, integer. And then I have measured this, and you can also check this in the specification of the NEC protocol, that the time between two, the two pulses, uh, or the falling edges, when it's a one, is going to be slightly larger than two milliseconds. And if it's a zero, it's going to be shorter than two milliseconds. And this means that I can just check the time value here. And, and if it's larger than two milliseconds, I count it as a one. And if it's smaller, I count it as a zero. And so this is going to keep on uh, triggering this until the entire message has been decoded, until we have reached pulse 34. And once we have reached pulse 34, it means that we have received the entire message. So we had filled uh, the value of this uh, struct here. And the next thing we have to do then is to save the message that we have received. So I'm going to have a function called is message pulse. And I'm going to have a ring buffer that I can save the message to here. To ring buffer, so I'm just adding a comment for now. So that inline bool is message pulse. So if it's pulse 34, it means that we have received the entire message. I'm also going to add a to do here to handle the case when we keep the button pressed, because then it's going to keep on sending a repeating uh, pulse at a given interval. But first I just want to have the implementation in place for receiving a single message. And after I've received the message, I'm going to start the timer again. And note, when I start the timer here, I'm going to clear the value of the 
uh, timer so that the timer start basically restarts the timer from the beginning. And this way I restart the timer for each pulse which makes it possible for me to track the time between the individual pulses. Okay, so next I'm going to add the code for the ring buffer that I implemented in an earlier video uh, in the UART video. And I'm not going to explain this implementation in this video, so if you're interested in how I implemented the ring buffer, you should uh, go and check out my previous video. I've just copied in the code from my main project into these two files and then I can define the ring buffer in this file and I'm going to have this ring buffer be able to store up to 10 elements. And then inside this function I can simply call ring buffer put buffer and then add the decoded 8-bit value, uh, the command value irmessage.decoded.cmd like that and then I can also add a function to retrieve a command from this uh, ring buffer and here I'm going to first check if there is any element inside the ring buffer and if there are I'm going to get the oldest element and then I can return the command and since I access the ring buffer inside this interrupt function as well as in this function uh, to make the access to a ring buffer mutually exclusive I will disable the interrupts in this function while I uh, retrieve the value from the ring buffer in case I call this function at, at the same time as I receive an incoming pulse I can also handle the timeout here now. So when a timeout occurs, I want to stop the timer, but I also want to clear the pulse count and clear the message. So that the next pulse that happens is counted as a fresh transmission. So let's build this now. Oh yeah, I gave this the wrong name. This should be called ISR port two. And this should not be struct, it should be static. Now it builds. So let's jump to the main file and call irremote init and irremote get. And also include command. And then I'm just going to connect the launchpad. And then I can set up to trigger an interrupt when we have received a complete uh, command. So an interrupt right here. And now if I press the button, I expect to get an interrupt. So now I pressed button one and now I get a message that's just filled with zeros, which means that something must be wrong. Okay, so I noticed one issue in my code. Uh, I noticed that the interrupt kept on triggering and that's because I don't properly clear the bit here. This should be the inverted bit zero. So I need a tilde character here. So let's rebuild this and see if that fixes it. Yeah, so now I get the decoded message. So for when I press button one, I will get the value 162 and then I can just try to press another button for example 2 and then I get another value for the command and if I press for example up I get another value and so on and then I'm just going to fill this enum here with these uh, values so that each uh, enum value corresponds to the command uh, value like this the next thing I want to do is to implement the handling for repeating messages because if I keep one of the buttons uh, on this remote pressed the transmission is going to look uh, something like this. So first I'm going to get the entire message just as I have implemented now but then if I keep it pressed I'm just going to get these uh, small transmissions here uh, representing the repeat code. So they are going to come at an interval of uh, 108 milliseconds. So for each of these repeating codes, there is going to be two falling edges and 
once I receive the second falling edge for each each of these repeat codes, I'm going to count that as another message. But I'm not going to count the first repeat code as another message because the first repeat code just marks the start of uh, repeating messages. So after I've received the first message, that is the uh, first 34 pul pulses, then I'm going to skip the next two pulses and then I'm going to check all of the pulses uh, after that. So this means that I'm going to check pulses over uh, pulse 36. So after pulse 36, I'm going to count every other pulse as another message. So I can add a define here that just checks if uh, the pulse uh, count is uh, odd. And I'm going to add another define for that. Let's move these down. Define is odd. And the most efficient way to check if a number is odd or not is to just check the last bit value of the number because if the last bit value uh, is uh, or this the, if the least significant bit of a number is one that means it's odd and if it's zero it's even and this is just to avoid the modular operation which is more expensive than simply doing the AND operation here with this addition in place i'm also going to count the repeating messages but as you can see now, I'm not actually checking the time between the individual pulses. I'm just making sure, or I'm just checking the number of pulses I receive, which means that this code is quite friendly when it comes to the timing of the individual pulses. But I can make this more robust by adding another function that actually sanity checks the time between the different pulses, just to make sure that I'm actually decoding the right signal. Uh, so let's say for example that I first receive an initial message and then I receive the start of the uh, repeating messages, so the first repeating code, and then the next repeating code arrives much sooner than I expect it to arrive. That means that there is something wrong with the transmission or that I release the button here and press, quickly press the button again to start a new transmission. And with this new function in place I'm going to uh, realize that I have uh, got a new pulse when I don't expect to get it and then I can simply restart the transmission here instead and this just makes this code a bit more robust so if I get an invalid pulse or if I get a pulse when I don't uh, expect to get a pulse, I'm just going to assume that the new transmission has started. So I'm going to set the pulse count to one and clear the message variable. And note, I'm just doing some rough sentence check in this function because I'm just checking if the pulse has arrived within a given time and I'm not checking like if the time the pulse arrived is uh, larger than a given value and smaller than a given value. I just check if it's smaller than a given value. And I roughly know when the pulses arrives because I've checked the value of the timer uh, for each uh, pulse by uh, putting a breakpoint for each uh, pulse value. And let's see if this builds now. It does not, of course. Oh yeah, I should pass timer here as well. So now that this isolated implementation is done, I'm going to move this code to my main project instead. So in my main project code, I use my IO functions to uh, configure the interrupt for this pin. So I just pass the interrupt handle function to uh, this function. And then I can also add a test function for this. And I'm actually going to trace the command value in this test function. So I'm going to initialize trace init as well as I remote in it and then busy wait for let's say 250 milliseconds and I'm going to create another function to translate the value of the command to a string 
make sure that I also include IRMO. So we just one big switch statement and then uh, return a string for each case. And build. This should be common. And I also need to include IO. And Yeah, and for the launch pad, I need to replace this with IR remote. Oh, I have to remove void here as well. Let's call this get this command. So let's test this function now. So when I press the buttons now, so for example, if I press one, seems to kind of work, but well, it doesn't seem to work perfectly because I'm getting a bunch of unknowns as well. So let me debug this. Okay, so I noticed one mistake I made here. This should be AND and not OR. So let's just clean and try to build this. So now if I press button one, I get one, two, three, four, five. So all buttons seems to be working. And if I, for example, keep the button up uh, pressed, yeah, so the repeating code seems to work as well. Good. Okay, so now that this code works as part of my main project, it's time to commit it. But before I do, I want to fix one issue that one of you pointed out in my previous video, uh, which is related to the UART driver. Because in the put character function here, I got the carriage return and line field mixed up. They should be uh, the other way around. So I'm just going to move this up here. And I have this handling here because there are some terminals that requires this. I think it's primarily uh, terminals in Windows. And I'm going to do the same for the polling function. Okay, let's build this again to make sure that it works. Yeah, and it still works. So then I can go ahead and commit this. So first create a new local branch. And format static analysis. So finally I get some complaints uh, when running CPP check. And that's because I have a bunch of values inside the decoded struct that are not used. 
and that's true because I don't because I'm just using the command value. And I can suppress those warnings by just adding a comment above the uh, values. So like this. And after that, I can go ahead and add the changes. So I'm going to add all changes except for the UART file because I'm going to put that in a separate commit. I should also write a comment on top of the header file, as I usually do. And then I can add the fix in the UART driver to a separate commit. I should also run the build script. Now I can push the changes. And then head over to GitHub to open a pull request and make sure that the CI pass. And it passed, so I can go ahead and merge the pull request. Okay, so now I have a way to send command from this IR mode. I'm mostly going to use this when I start controlling the motors and have to test the different drive commands. Uh, but this was all for this video, so see you in the next one.